लेट अस चैंट द प्रेयर सर्वे भवंतु सुखी नह सर्वे संतु निरामया सर्वे भद्राणि पश्यन्तु मा कश्चि दुख भाग भवे मे ऑल बी हैप्पी मे ऑल बी फ्री फ्रॉम इलनेस मे ऑल अचीव परफेक्शन इन दिस लाइफ मे नन सफर फ्रॉम मिजरीज इन दिस वर्ल्ड ओम पीस 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 बी अनटू ऑल once again please switch off your video and also microphone we have promised to speak on the yoga sutras this is a very famous book not because it is studied by so many people but because the yoga that is called hatha yoga is being practiced by many people throughout the world everywhere so the word yoga is much known and it is much misunderstood because people think that yoga means physical exercises or hatha yoga but yoga sutra is a moksha shastra is a book which help us helps us to get liberation it is one of the six systems of indian philosophy it has got that importance and if we are able to understand yoga sutra in a proper way then we will see that our <laughs> will help us our yoga and physical exercise what we do they will give us much more benefit out of them they are necessary they are not an end please switch off your what is it that you need to need to hold it yoga exercises are good good for our physical body and it helps us to build up physical and mental strength and these things are necessary to understand the philosophy the path of liberation which has been discussed in the yoga sutra in a better way now let me begin with the date of this great book it is dated before 400 ad and that means that it has an age of about 1600 years before us so this ancient yoga was almost lost until the 18th century when swami vivekananda explained it in the english language that was yes, that was in 19th century swami vivekananda calls it the science of religion it is in a sense a foundation the foundation of hindu psychology and almost all the other schools of philosophy in india in some way or other borrow some ingredients from the yoga sutras in order to formulate their methods of practices to realize a spiritual goal many many of these schools have adopted some techniques from these yoga sutras 
So it is actually a very important book. And who is the writer of this book? The writer's name is Patanjali, Maharshi Patanjali. He is that Patanjali of the fame of writing the great commentary on the grammar, Sanskrit grammar written by Panini. And they say that Maharshi Patanjali is the incarnation of Shesha Naga or Ananta Naga. Shesha means, I will explain that one. This, this is a divine snake which has got many, many hooves. And through different mouths, it creates, it uh, brings about different creations. So this is the foundation of all varieties of creations. And this Panini is, uh, this Patanjali is the writer of this Yoga Sutras. And he wrote a great commentary on the grammar of Panini, who lived about 500 years before Christ. This Panini wrote some formulas in his grammar. Uh, they are almost like algebraic equations. So many years ago, that precise mathematical knowledge is unbelievable. The basic algebraic grammatical formulas are only 14. Only 14 formulas control the whole grammar system, Sanskrit grammar system. That is why Sanskrit is the most computer compatible language. Let me take a diversion or deviation just for example of a scientific discipline. In Sanskrit grammar, the vowels are organized in the beginning. All the vowels come in the beginning. And all the consonants come there. The first vowel is A or O in Sanskrit is called A, which is the very first letter of the Sanskrit alphabet. A. And that is the very first letter of the Sanskrit alphabet and it actually, all the consonants end with this A, like ka, kha, ga, ga, it is all with A. That is the discipline. But in English, for example, the consonants ending with, suppose, B, C, D, Phi, no, F, it changes, G, no, G, there it is G, then H, not He. So that is different. In German, B, C, D, Phi, no, F, G, then Ha. So these are all, um, uh, what the, the tradition is broken, the discipline is broken in these systems, but the Panini grammar continues to maintain that system. All the letters will end with the first vowel, all the consonants, the first vowel called A. Now, what is the meaning of this word Sheshanaga? Sheshanaga is the representation of the creation in the form of a divine snake. It is mythically and psychologically presented as the kundalini power in every human being. The word Shesha means residue, residue, what remains. And Naga means that which cannot walk on food. So at the end of the creation, as it is understood, the matter becomes very condensed and becomes very small 
and it coils up in a very subtle form or potential form in which time and space go into causal state. It is the power of God that can again manifest itself as another creation. So Seshanaga means it is the coiled up residual energy of a creation and that is considered to be the kundalini in each one of us. And <coughs> this book, Yoga Sutra has 196 aphorisms. What is an aphorism? An aphorism is defined as a thing which uses very few words, very few words, and those words do not have dual meanings. They have only one meaning. And at the same time, the same word can contain a huge amount of interpretation or explanation. It does not use any extra letter and it is enough to convey its meaning. So it uses three, four words, five words like that. These are called sutras. So this Yoga Sutra has got 196 aphorisms. We will start with the sutras and you will see then that uh, these sutras have got only few words, but meaning is very deep and can be explained in a very big way. Let me clarify one thing in the beginning itself. Yoga does not mean a connection. Generally speaking, the etymological meaning of the word is yoga means a connection. But according to Yoga Sutras, because it is a philosophy, it uses technical words. And the word yoga itself is very important to be explained technically. So here the yoga does not mean a connection. That we have to remember. It means rather a disconnection. In the Yoga Sutra itself, the second chapter, aphorism number 25 says that when we detach ourselves from matter or from unreality and then we are in ourselves, in ourselves. So it is a detachment, disconnection and then it is called yoga. Even Sri Krishna in the Gita also explains it that way that Dukkha Sanyoga Vyoga, when we are connected with this world which is nothing but Dukkha, suffering, that's what Buddha has said, Dukkham Dukkham Dukkham, Sarvameva Dukkham. The whole thing, the whole world is nothing but suffering, suffering because it attaches you to it and makes you forget your own nature. The idea here in the yoga is that one has to get detached from all worldliness. Worldliness means selfishness. Sri Ramakrishna and Holy Mother also have said, it is not bad to be in the world. It is not bad to be in the world, but it is bad to be of the world, to be of the world. We can live in this world, but we should not be of the world. We can, it is, it is a place where we live, but we can leave this place and go to some other place. And at the same time, Sri Ramakrishna has said that this detachment does not mean that you get detached from this worldliness or connection with the world. Rather, you get attached to yourself, to God. First to God and then to your own being. One connection is broken because another connection is established. Otherwise, what happens if we get detached from this world? 
we are disgusted with this world. We don't want to be in the world. Then what happens? And we have nothing to hold on to. Then we commit suicide. But detachment means detachment from our selfishness or attachment to this world and gaining attachment to God. This is the idea in the Yoga Sutra. Yoga means it is a disconnection, not a connection. Technically, it, is, it should be correct. And that connection idea comes from non-dual Vedanta. And most of the time, because we are so much overwhelmed by the philosophy of non-dual Vedanta and its reasonings, we really forget that there is something different from that. So we have to remember this, that yoga means a disconnection. I am telling it again and again because we need to get very much acquainted with this idea in the Yoga Sutras. Otherwise, we may mess up with the meanings of different aphorisms in the book itself. The first aphorism in the Yoga Sutra is like this. Atha Yoga Anusasana. Atha Yoga Anusasana. Now this word Atha has got different meanings, but what is the meaning here? Because it is one word, the three words make the first aphorism. Atha is one word. So it should have to be understood properly in the context. Author means the person who wants to study and practice yoga should take up this book and open it. It is meant for that person. So it speaks of a competence. Who will study this book? The person who wants to study who is capable of studying this, who is entitled to study. So they say adhikarartham. It speaks of a competence. And then the commentator, the famous commentator of Yoga Sutra is known as Vyasa. He says that this is the Yoga Sutra and its teachings are universal. Universal. It does not say that it is meant for men, not for women. It does not say that. It does not differentiate between black and white, man or woman, tall or small, people belonging to this country or that country, this religion or that religion. Not like that. Anyone can practice this yoga anyone can study this yoga there is no question of nationality gender religion etc you take for instance the yoga exercises yoga exercises do they speak of any such distinction so vyasa is very particular about it so vyasa has said that uh, anyone, irrespective of the color, language, gender or anything, can study this book. It is universal. Sarva Bhagavatam, he says. Sarva Bhagavatam means universality. And what is yoga? Atha, yoga, anusasanam. These are the three words. What is yoga? Yoga is samadhi. Yoga means Samadhi. Samadhi or spiritual realization is the ultimate goal of this scripture. And the last word is Anushasanam. Anushasanam means instruction and it is not simply just instruction. It means a kind of uh, practical teaching. Practical training, not just teaching with the blackboard. 
but teaching just like the yoga teachers they do not not only explain a particular posture but they show how to do it they not only say but they show you how to do this and there are different stages of practicing one posture you cannot just begin with the final posture you have to practice it stage by stage and then achieve that posture this is like that anushasana means it is a book it is a teaching which is connected very much with the practice otherwise this teaching will not bear any fruit we will not understand anything about this if we do not practice it we will not understand anything about the things that is being promised by this book so anushasanam anushasanam means it is not a theoretical teaching but it is a practical training so we should be prepared to start with our practice as we go on learning we should sit back and may contemplate on the ideas that we have learned and then we will see that we will achieve <coughs> mastery over our own mind we will achieve mastery over our own body these are the things which will be achieved when we start practicing yoga is samadhi it has been said but what type of samadhi what is this samadhi where does it happen it is very much concerned or connected with our own mind and the processes that are being discussed they really happen in our mind when it says concentrate that should happen in our mind when it says concentrate on such object that concentration should happen in our mind when it says you withdraw your mind from that problem and fix it on this object that happens in our mind it happens in our mind so mind is the main thing in the yoga sutra and there, therefore they say that it is chitta the mind so yoga ha chitta vritti nirodha we have seen we will see that the second aphorism will come so yoga happens in our mind stuff which is called antakarana which is the inner organ and that mind achieves this yoga this mind in the commentary of this first aphorism vyasa says has got five bhumis levels or modes five modes kshipta scattering mode mudha lazy darkening mode deluding mode vikshipta it is sometimes scattered sometimes gathered ekagra one pointed and niruddha concentrated so first one is kshipta or scattered mind that means that our mind by its nature is always with some object even if i am sitting without doing anything physically my mind will be working my mind will be connected with an object either it is a physical object or a thought my and it's 4:30 here my mind will be connected please switch off your microphones so it is always with any object so therefore it is always scattered and when it is not only with an object it is with a kind of with a sense organ suppose i am looking at an object so my mind is connected with the eyes and through that connected with the object so it is also connected with the sense organs and now it is connected with the eyes next moment it may be connected with the ears next moment it may be connected with the nose like that we go on experiencing different different objects of different sense organs 
and it is not always with the you know, objects outside, but objects inside also. But yoga says it is not possible to meditate with this mind. When our mind is very disturbed, it is not possible to meditate with this mind. And it is not possible to meditate with this mind to achieve our spiritual goal or holy goal. But Yoga Sutra says that this mind also can concentrate. But it does not concentrate on any spiritual goal. At this time, if we talk about morality, good ideas, the mind is not interested in that. But it can concentrate on anything or any person it hates. It can attain dhyanam, meditation, on something it hates or something or someone it is angry with. This it can do, but this kind of meditation is not real meditation because it does not lead us to the goal of this book, the purpose of this book. Then mind has got another mode and that is called mudha, darkening mode. So Vivekananda translated it as darkening, the deluded mind. Mind has become so deluded that we cannot meditate on any spiritual object, on any object which has a spiritual connotation. But again, it, this mind also can meditate on anything or any person it is obsessed with or it is wrongly enchanted by. This is called delusion. Without knowing the real nature of the thing, we get enchanted of charmed by this outer appearances. And then we get so much attached that we forget about other things. And we forget that there is something better than this. So this is called mudha. We get deluded and the mind becomes deluded and it gets enchanted or attached, concentrated on any object. But that does not bring us spiritual liberation, which is the goal of this book. Then we come to the third mode of this mind, which is called Vikshipta. Vikshipta literally means, which is also again completely scattered. So this, this is the beauty of Sanskrit language. You know. Vikshipta can be Vishesha Rupanya Shipta, means it is completely scattered. But here the meaning is Vishishta Rupanya Shipta. It is <coughs> sometimes scattered and sometimes gathered. Vishishta Rupena Shipta. Shipta itself is disturbed. And now Vikshipta is not very much disturbed. It is sometimes scattered, sometimes gathered. And this is the mode of the mind when meditation is possible. We can try to concentrate. When the mind is gathered, we can try to concentrate. But because of its unsteadiness, it cannot hold on to one thing for a long time. That is a problem here with this mind. It gives us a ray of hope that we can start with practicing meditation. But the problem happens that this stage of mind or this mode of mind does not have <coughs> steadiness. So it jumps from one object to another object to another object. That is what Sri Ramakrishna says. He says, this mind is like, suppose a person wants to dig a well to get water. This person goes on digging, digging, digging. After digging five feet inside, he <coughs> surely did not get water. Then he left that place, went to another place, started digging there. Again there, after digging five feet, then it left that place, went to some other place. So what happened finally, that uh, he did not get water. He labored very hard. He really worked very hard, but it did not produce any result because of his unsteadiness. So this mind also does not help us in achieving our spiritual goal, which is 
the purpose of this book. Then Ekagra. Ekagra means another mode of mind which is called Ekagra one-pointed. One-pointed towards one object. This is called Ekagra. Slowly the mind becomes concentrated and concentrated for a longer period of time. And this stage is called Savikalpa Samadhi. Savikalpa Samadhi has got different stages. Seven, seven stages it has. And to achieve the final Savikalpa Samadhi, we have to go through these seven, seven stages. We will come to that later on. Actually speaking, the word dhyanam or meditation means broken concentration. It is not that when I have started meditation, started with the meditation, that my mind will be concentrated and there will be no distraction, there will be no break in that. No. Dhyana means vichidya vichidya, means it gets broken, broken. But we continue to start again, continue after the break, we continue with the same object. Then it gets the practice to remain with the same object for a longer period of time. So the, the frequency comes down and wavelength increases. It is like that. Frequency of breakage, that will come down. In a minute I used to have one or two breaks. Now in five minutes one break. So the length increases. This is called Ekagra Chitta, the state of the mind which is very conducive for meditation. And in this stage, one has to work very sincerely because it is really helping. So one has to work very sincerely. And that helps us to achieve our Samadhi through these Savikalpa Samadhis. And third one is Niruddha, that is called Nirodha Samadhi, that is completely concentrated. Completely concentrated, there will be no break in that. And that will be called Awesome Pragnata Samadhi. That Samadhi will be called a Samadhi which does not have any break. We will discuss the details afterwards when that particular aphorism comes. So the second aphorism now we take up is Yoga Chitta Vrittihi Nirodha. Yoga is one word, Chitta Vritti another word, Nirodha another word. These are the three words which makes this aphorism. So it shows that our final samadhi, the nirodha samadhi is achieved through some intermediary stages. I said that there are seven such intermediary stages. Now let us take the first word yoga. We have seen that this is samadhi. So it is now defining what yoga is. The first aphorism or the beginning of the book said, Atha Yoga Anushasanam. So now the person who is entitled to read this book called Yoga, for him the instructions start. Now second aphorism is explaining what is Yoga. Atha Yoga, now second one is Yoga Chitta Vrittihi Nirodha. Yoga means, this is the working principle, Yoga means Chitta Vrittihi Nirodha, try to control the changes in your mind. This is the instruction in a simple language, but its language is technical, so I will have to go through this technicality and I will try to explain it in as simple way as possible. So Chitta Vritti, Chitta Vritti, now first is Yoga, Chitta Vritti Nirodha, Vyasa says, it does not say 
sarva chitta vritti nirupa sarva word is not there not complete cessation or stoppage of modifications of the mind yoga means all our efforts all our endeavors to reach the highest samadhi even the first step is also regarded to be yoga i have to walk 100 steps but i am on the way the first step even though it is the lowest one the beginning but it is a primary importance without this i cannot achieve 100 steps i have to take the first step so i am trying to be a yogi i am trying to concentrate i am trying to achieve meditation so i have started it it does not mean that i am a 100% yogi my meditation will become 100% successful no it may be in the beginning 2% <coughs> but i'll try to do it this 2% continuously uniformly so yoga means my concentration on god is 2% in the morning minus 10% in the afternoon it should not happen like that uniformly 2% that is the practice we need to practice to maintain that uniformity so sarva word is not used here because even the minimum of effort that we take towards this that is lauded praised shri krishna says in the gita <coughs> swalpam apyasya yogasya swalpam a little bit of this trayate mahato bhaya saves you from a great great fear or danger because you have taken a step towards the right direction so therefore chitta vritti nirodha does not means all chitta vritti nirodha it begins from the beginning and what is this chitta as i have said the word chitta means actually in broader sense mind stuff or mind the internal organ now what is vritti in this 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 word will be explained afterwards but just to give an idea vritti means some modifications happen suppose i was looking at something which is agreeable so my mind had some kind of feeling they say this <coughs> mind is made of three gunas three gunas means three forces guna means force three forces strong forces weak forces and magnetism like that this is not these are not the forces here they are talking about forces like sattva guna rajo guna tamo guna these are the three constituents of the mind and these three forces balance themselves in the mind sattva guna is the force of tranquility rajo guna is the force of activity tamo guna is the force of inertia these are the three forces which make the mind these are the constituents of the mind so the mind is now tending to change itself in different ways changing itself in different ways some agreeable thing i see the sattva guna is is helping me the sattva guna is um more manifested and then what happens my mind takes a wonder has a wonderful feel a good feeling because it is sattva guna and i am looking at a thing which is agreeable which i like which is peaceful then the mind takes a form and this form is simple quiet undisturbed let me give you an example suppose there are three circles drawn on the blackboard one circle is just a circle there is nothing inside it 
just a circle. And if you look at that circle, then what happens? Calm, quiet, no disturbance in it. But if you look at a circle which has got many dots inside that, and you are asked to count those dots, then it is a big problem. Problem means mind becomes so disturbed. Your mind loses that calmness. You are not happy with this kind of situation. That is Rajoguna. Activity starts. And then Tamoguna. Tamoguna is, uh, there, there is a circle with many hatched lines inside this and boring lines, boring, boring, the mind becomes dull. So these are the three gunas which make our mind. These are the three constituents of our mind, Sattva, Raja and Tamaguna. And these gunas, they, they are creating experiences for us. Creating some impressions in the mind. That means they are bringing about some changes in the mind. And these changes are consecutive, similar type of changes or different types of changes. <coughs> so these changes are called the vrittis. They are in the form of a circle. Vritta means a circle. Vritti in small circle. Chitta vritti, the changes in the mind, modifications in the mind. And these vrittis, they go on balancing, rebalancing with each other. There is always a, an activity going on in this. And yoga will help us to give this mind a direction not to get confused with these pulls, pulls or pushes, these gunas, these forces, not to get confused, bewildered, but to get a direction. How to get out of this, get rid of these troubles, then it gets a direction and it starts following that direction. That is why the Yoga Sutra has divided the whole structure, the pathway, into these seven different milestones. And each particular portion of this pathway has its definitions. Definitions means what are the sceneries which will be available when you are treading along this path up to the next stop. You will find these things on the right side, you will find these things on the left side, like that. It is narrating about all these different views that we encounter along our path. And those things, when we know beforehand, then when we are treading that path and seeing those things, these are approval of our progress. So that is why Swami Vivekananda said that yoga is the science of religion. Because it is verifiable. You can verify with your own experiences that you are on the right track and how far you have come. The milestones have been numbered. When you see milestone number two, then you know where you are then you know that the next milestone will be in milestone number three, that is sure. And you know that you have already passed through the experiences which have been promised by the first part of this yoga, first part of this travel. You, have, you got an house part, an, an exit. There you got some kind of <coughs> entertaining things, some kind of food, some kind of shops, all these things you got there. So all these things are made available in, during this journey. So you know that you have achieved these things. And therefore, it helps you 
to get more and more inspired to follow this path. So therefore, they have not presented a very lofty and fantastic idea, ideal before you that is very difficult to be reached. No, they have presented the ideal, but they have given the intermediary or they have broken it into the sub ideals, broken into some subsections. So you don't need to jump onto the last one, just go on following one after another. But the goal remains the same, and that goal is the goal of all these steps all these different parts of that part of that way so the last is the goal so we have to walk along this therefore it says yoga chitta vritti niroga chitta the mind has its modifications and we have to reduce these modifications until to the point where we come to the point where we see there are no more disturbances. One of our senior Swamis asked Swami Bhuteshanandaji, how do I know that my mind has become pure? Chitta Suddhi, how do I know that I have achieved Chitta Suddhi? How do I know that my mind has become pure? Bhuteshanandaji Maharaj gave one simple answer. He said, when no impure thoughts arises in your mind, then your mind is pure. No impure thought arises in your mind. So yoga helps us to clean the mind this way and so that we go to a point where no impure thoughts arises in our mind. No distractions come. And of course, it is true that when we follow this path, then we will be much more convinced, we will be much more strong, and there will be less chances of our deviation. There will be less chances of our distractions. We will not be simply taken or simply deluded by things in this world. We will not be deluded by the things presented to us by this kshipta mudha vikshipta mind. We will know which is what. No red herring can help us to deviate from our path. This is the truth. The more we follow this path, the greater conviction we get. And that is what is called science. So chitta vritti, the modifications, the whirlpools, the different types of changes in our mind, they will stop, stop gradually and finally it will reach the end which is very clean, clear. There is no further modification. So this is the idea given in the second aphorism. So now we Remember, or let us recapitulate these ideas in the two aphorisms. First one is, Atha Yoga Anushasanam now begins the instructions for practicing yoga, or now begins the book which is called yoga. This is a simple meaning. And this yoga is meant for a person who is trying to achieve some success in respect of reorganizing the mind, giving the mind a better direction, <laughs> struggling with himself or herself. But now there is a help. The yoga book comes to our help to show us how to do it. And our mind passes through different, different modes. We are aware of those modes. So when I see that my mind is very much concentrated with one person, 
because of some wrong reason. Shipta mind, concentrated at the same time. Then I know it is not helpful for me to realize my purpose. I will give you an example. I will keep <coughs> the names of the persons in this example within myself. A young novice in our order went to one of our senior swamis <clears throat> and he was not happy with the with the dealings of the manager Swamiji of that center. He was not happy with his dealings. So he went to the senior Swamiji and because the senior Swamiji was very sympathetic to the young brahmacharis, he used to help them, guide them. So this brahmachari went, sat near him and told him his difficulties, his problems with the manager Swamiji. This senior Swamiji, very senior in those days, he listened to the complaint and he went on nodding and saying yes, 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 like that. And after this brahmachari, this young novice finished his complaint, he took enough time to explain why he was upset with the manager Swamiji. Then this senior Swamiji who was almost all the while closing the eyes and nodding the head and saying, ah, I see, I see. The Swamiji opened the eyes, looked directly into the eyes of the, into the eyes of this um, <clears throat> novice and said, I think you are meditating more on manager than on Sri Ramakrishna. I think you are meditating more on manager than on Sri Ramakrishna. And that was the truth. That was the truth. So see the condition of the mind. He has come, he has become a novice to follow a spiritual path. But still he is suffering from this trouble. This is natural because he has begun the life. Therefore the mind has to learn slowly together with him the ways. So, but the Swami was uncompromising, the senior Swamiji. But he pointed out that this Brahmachari, this young novice, he was much um, concentrated on the on this manager Swamiji because of his hatred or because of his disagreement. See that that is the truth. When afterwards this novice confided to another person saying that yes, when I started meditating every day, I would similarly start thinking of these problems. So from that day he learned the lesson and he was able to control anger or hatred. So these are truths about our own mind. The Yoga Sutra gives us a guideline, gives us some well chalked out plan how to reorganize our mind. <clears throat> it is not actually controlling the mind. The mind control, we use this word always. It is not controlling the mind. It is reorganizing the mind. It has got every good stuff in it and it has got all energy. This Rajoguna, tremendous energy, active energy. But we have to give, use that energy for a good purpose. Same energy. Sri Ramakrishna has said, give it a U-turn. Just change the direction. Then the same energy can be used for good purpose. You don't have to borrow energy from outside. It is there, but you are misusing it, dissipating that energy for useless things. That is the teaching in the Yoga Sutra. And therefore, this Chitta Vritti Nirodhaha, we have to practice this so that we can reorganize 
the mind so that the modifications which are not helpful for achieving the goal for which we have started practicing we have to stop those modifications not and afterwards we will learn how to do that not directly confronting them but diverting our attention to something else which is of much value to our goal this is the idea which we get from these two aphorisms we will elaborate on different aspects of it afterwards while we go on repeating other aphorisms following aphorisms in this book so i would end my talk here today it is by the way of an introduction to the yoga sutras i am thankful to you all we will have our next